Misinformation has become a public safety crisis. You are fake news. The facts have shown that the election was stolen. The news isn't going to tell us the truth. And then I said, supposing you brought the light inside the body, you can, which you can do either through the skin or in some other way. AI generated call is falsely telling Democratic voters not to vote in tomorrow's primary. President Reagan was an excellent president, too. When content goes viral, we're really saying that a piece of information has spread so fast and so far as to mimic the qualities of a contagion. Which is all fun and games when what's circulating is a cute baby animal meme or a sourdough hack, but it becomes extremely dangerous when fake news starts passing itself off as truth. For democracy to work, voters need to understand what information is worth acting on, so we can support policy policies and politicians who actually represent our interests. But humans have struggled to differentiate fact from fiction for pretty much as long as we've had language, and technological advancements have only made the task more difficult. Today, armed with a uniquely potent combination of social media and AI, bad actors, foreign and domestic, have everything they need to sow chaos efficiently and on a mass scale. To protect ourselves, we need reliable tools and techniques to help us discern what's real and true from what's fake and meant to manipulate or misinform us. Without this, the shared reality needed to create a functioning society has the very real possibility of slipping away. This is how media literacy will save democracy. Roll the intro. Context on the news you're reading is a key way to increase your media literacy. So let's use what's been happening in Palestine as an example. This war is incredibly contentious and can lead to biased reporting on both sides. And recent coverage of a ceasefire plan is a great example of this. Ground News compiled 207 articles covering Secretary of State Antony Blinken's reaction to some proposed changes by Hamas. You can follow along at ground.news Lija. Right-leaning New York Post reports Blinken slams Hamas for refusing ceasefire proposal, says terrorists could have ended God a bloodshed with one word. While leftist publication Truthout says Hamas wants guarantees ceasefire will actually happen. Reading the news from both sides of the political spectrum increases your media literacy by helping you think critically about any bias within their coverage. This can even ease any tension you might have with that one relative you just can't politically agree with. Because when you know where information is coming from, you can have more conversations grounded in facts and less in frustration. But Ground News does more than let you seamlessly compare coverage. I can also see only 20% of right-leaning sources are covering the story, meaning if you aren't intentionally balancing the type of news outlets you stay up to date with, it could have missed your radar. And out of all 207 outlets, most are considered highly factual or credible, ratings backed by independent news monitoring organizations. Scrolling down, I also see 50% of these news publishers are owned by media conglomerates. In fact, most of the media you consume, everything from news to the internet to TV, is owned by just six media conglomerates, which makes seeking out diverse sources crucial for a balanced understanding of the world. Lucky for us, today's sponsor, Ground News, makes this really easy to do. And considering half of the world is voting this year, my favorite ground news feature at the moment is their election-focused blind spot feed. With a bird's eye view of issues that tend to get more attention from the left or right than others, I can easily step out of my echo chamber and understand how partisan narratives shape reality and votes. I'm always really impressed with ground news and genuinely think they're a great source for identifying biases in the media. So scan my QR code, click the link in the description, or go to ground.news Lija to get 40% off the same vantage plan I use to stay informed. Get unlimited access to all ground news has to offer while helping an independent team keep the media transparent. Thanks, Ground News. In 2018, the think tank RAND launched a campaign to counter truth decay. It's term to describe the diminishing role of facts and analysis in American public life since the dawn of the new millennium. According to RAND, truth decay is eroding civil discourse, causing political paralysis, and leading to general uncertainty around what is and isn't true. In November 2017, Facebook estimated as many as 126 million users had been exposed to Russian ads fomenting political division before and after the 2016 election. That was the same election cycle that saw British data analytics firm Cambridge Analytica illegally harvest information from 50 million people's Facebook profiles, most of them belonging to registered U.S. voters, to build a highly personalized political ad targeting system. However, the problem wasn't confined to Facebook. A Princeton-led study of fake news consumption during the 2016 campaign found that false articles made up 2.6% of all hard news late in the cycle. Hard news, the type of news that's supposed to focus entirely on facts, and that's 
very disturbing because without a common set of facts, policymakers can't make progress on major issues facing our country. And when policymakers don't appear to be well informed, public trust in institution collapses. The further we burrow into our polarized echo chambers, the more remote the possibility of civil discourse becomes, and the more dangerous we become to one another. <laughs> In February 2020, when fewer than 2,000 people total had died from the COVID-19 pandemic, the World Health Organization announced that fake news about the outbreak was spreading faster than the virus itself, creating a parallel infection that WHO dubbed an infodemic. As leading authorities and experts struggled to get their hands around the rapidly developing global health crisis, the public struggled to cope with the uncertainty. Remember when we thought wiping down cardboard packages would stop COVID from getting into the house, and then months later, and PR was like, mm, never mind. Panic made people try a lot worse ideas than that. Because once you think nobody at the CDC knows anything, why not try injecting bleach? A 2022 study on the impacts of the infodemic found that misinformation on social media undermined effective strategies, including masking, social distancing, and vaccination. In 2021, the U.S. Surgeon General warned that misinformation had become the single greatest threat to COVID-19 vaccination efforts. Misinformation increased vaccine hesitancy, lowered overall vaccination rates and caused preventable deaths. But disease isn't the only deadly danger a poorly informed populace faces. A 2022 policy paper from the Stimson Center explored how social media misinformation worsens political instability and legitimizes mass atrocities by encouraging a permissive societal bandwagon effect that fosters violence against targeted groups. We saw this play out firsthand when misinformation led to a rise in hate crimes against visibly Asian people during the pandemic. And we know it's a problem. In an AP poll from 20 2022, about three quarters of U.S. adults identified misinformation as a major problem contributing to more extreme political views and behaviors, including violence based on race, religion, or gender. What I find so fascinating about that poll result is the blame shifting it implies. Almost 75% of American adults see the spread of misinformation as a dire problem, yet that problem is framed as something external. In 2022, a political analysis found that the most frequent sharers of fake news were conservatives with low levels of conscientiousness and an appetite for chaos. So if you don't have those traits, it's probably tempting to lay the full scope of the misinformation crisis on those people's doorsteps and say, couldn't be me. But that's where you're wrong. If you've ever shared a headline without reading the article or cited a TikTok as a source in conversation, you're kind of part of the problem too. And by you, I mean me. Hi, it's me. I love learning things on TikTok and find it to be a great starting point for a lot of my content because that's where the discourse is happening. And even though I'm an educated 32-year-old lady with a law degree and a lot of self-awareness who does her best to share accurate content responsibly, I'm not perfect. And as long as we pretend that media literacy is a stable condition that can be achieved once and for all, we'll all continue abdicating our responsibility, giving away our chance to help make things better by actively participating. Yes, there's a lot more that social platforms and their algorithms and our government could be doing to help curb the spread of misinformation. But while they're leaving us hanging out here, there are some things we can do to help ourselves to make sure that at least we're not misinforming one another. Media literacy is a set of tools, yes, but also a mindset, one that must be consistently practiced and one that must constantly evolve with the times. Fake news, by which I mean false information circulated as fact, has been a problem since humans developed language. In the oral tradition, we call it gossip, the rumor mill, or just old wives' tales. And from pretty much the moment Johannes Gutenberg invented the printing press in 1439, people have been circulating bogus narratives using the written word too. We've been writing about sea monster sightings and religious conspiracies for centuries, okay? So we've always struggled to distinguish fact from fiction. Mass communication simply raised the stakes. But faced with the choice between habitual hierarchical censorship and the individual need to develop discernment, we in our so-called liberal democracies have tended to favor freedom of speech. In Areopagitica, John Milton's seminal defense of unlicensed printing, he argues that moral and intellectual development is predicated on opportunities to learn from freely circulated ideas. Instead of shielding people from so-called bad texts, Milton was like, bring them on. How's anyone supposed to learn the difference between good and evil if they can't sample both, you know what I mean? It's worth noting that Milton's approach had less to do with his faith in people and more to do with his faith in the power of truth itself. According to Britannica, to attempt to preclude falsehood, he believed, was to underestimate the power of truth. Milton obviously never anticipated the rise of AI deepfakes, but to be fair, he also lived hundreds of years before indoor plumbing, so...
Centuries later, our founders followed Milton's logic when they enshrined freedom of speech and the press in our Bill of Rights. Censorship, they believed, posed a far greater threat to democracy than unconstrained speech. But it wasn't until the Industrial Revolution made printing faster, cheaper, and easier than ever that literacy rates began to soar. Census data suggests that by 1920, as much as 94% of the population over 14 could read and write. However, as basic literacy became the norm, it also became clear that the truth would not simply become obvious without some additional training. Basic literacy has to do with a person's ability to understand the meaning of symbols on a page. But in its most nuanced form, literacy demands a conversation between the reader and the text itself. When we start to think of literacy as the capacity to analyze context, interrogate a source, or draw connections and conclusions, it makes much more sense as an ongoing practice. We don't turn our ability to read on and off, but how we interpret and internalize what we read definitely changes based on our mood, mindset, and various other circumstances. Without this more self-reflective brand of literacy, chaos lurks around every corner, as Americans learned the hard way one night in 1938. Ladies and gentlemen, the director of the Mercury Theater and star of these broadcasts, Orson Welles. On Sunday, October 30th, the night before Halloween, American actor and director Orson Welles caused a national panic when he broadcast his play, War of the Worlds, on the radio. Listeners who tuned in after the introductory warning had no idea that what sounded like breaking news bulletins describing a Martian invasion were actually part of the fictional performance. By the late 1930s, radio had become the primary technology for communicating breaking news. So when it came to War of the Worlds, people were primed to confuse the medium, radio, for the message news content. The problem wasn't that they didn't understand what the broadcast was saying, it's that they didn't have enough context to comprehend what it meant and act accordingly. Today, the accidental War of the Worlds hoax is still used to teach elementary and middle school students about media literacy and the importance of engaging mindfully with any message, regardless of the medium. As film became more prevalent and accessible, teachers were eager to experiment with a new medium. In 1922, an educator from Indianapolis was already using motion pictures to teach writing to eighth graders. In 1933, educational pioneer Edgar Dale wrote an early manual on using motion pictures as a teaching tool to help high schoolers develop critical analysis skills. As the film literacy movement took shape, children were taught to understand the language of film in the hope that it would both elevate their personal tastes while also protecting them from potentially nefarious influences. If young people understood the artifice of film, they wouldn't be so easily duped by sensationalism and propaganda. In fact, the word propaganda dates back to 1622 when the Catholic Church created the Congratio de Propaganda Fide to propagate the Catholic faith in non-Catholic countries. The term didn't develop a negative connotation until the mid-19th century when it entered the political sphere. In the U.S., the term was associated with fascist and communist propaganda, which had become a major concern among scholars by the second half of the 1930s. In 1937, a former journalist named Clyde R. Miller, no relation, founded the Institute for Propaganda Analysis to research how public opinion is influenced and provide solutions that would help the public public detect, analyze, and reject propaganda they encountered in the wild. In a 1939 lecture, Miller explained that since propaganda couldn't legally be prevented, given our whole First Amendment thing, and countering propaganda with more propaganda had too much risk of backfiring and deepening divisions and distrust, education was the only viable solution. In addition to showing up in schools and partnering with Scholastic Magazine to reach young students, Miller's Institute also served adults. Its popular weekly bulletin newsletter provided an an in-depth analysis of the propaganda techniques employed by all sides of a timely news topic, plus a list of sources and recommended reading. At its peak, 10,000 people subscribed and another 18,000 bought the bound volume of back issues every year. But the IPA suspended operations as the U.S. entered the Second World War in 1942, partially because we'd started making our own anti-Hitler propaganda, so having an institute that called out propaganda wouldn't be particularly helpful for our war efforts. Ironically, in 1947, the House on american Activity Committee attacked the Institute, calling it a communist front organization. It was part of a fun ramp up to the McCarthy years when, once again, the U.S. was making too much of its own propaganda to want a truly media literate population. Throughout the 50s and 60s, many educators focused on teaching kids the techniques and terminology of filmmaking, believing that if they understood how the sausage was made, they'd have no problem properly digesting the final product. But back then, making video content was a ginormous, very expensive pain in the ass, and students were often discouraged and distracted by how terrible their incredibly laborious films were. Honestly, I don't blame them. 
job. Around 30 hours of work goes into making each of my videos, and that's with all the bells and whistles and modern shortcuts. I cannot imagine the agony of taping together strips of film with a literal razor blade. Couldn't be me. If that's how editing was still done, I'd still be some sad lawyer schmuck instead of an internationally recognized YouTube personality. Anyway, as the Red Scare gave way to the civil rights era, media literacy began to be seen as a critical exercise of a person's democratic rights and civil responsibilities. Thinking critically about media took on political, ethical, and cultural dimensions. For the first time, it wasn't about sorting good from bad or good from communist. It was about digging into the nuances and interrogating the gray areas. Media literacy became a favorite tool of postmodernism, the late 20th century philosophy that more or less blew up the notion of objective truth in favor of countless unknowable subjectivities. The closer we edged towards the 21st century, the more urgent media literacy started to sound. A technological revolution was underway, and the speed and scope of communication were transforming once again. Today, media literacy has become an umbrella term, encompassing numerous subtypes, including critical media literacy, information literacy, news literacy, and digital literacy. For our purposes, let's keep it simple and broadly define media literacy using the five core concepts laid out by Elizabeth Thoman, founder of the Center for Media Literacy in the U.S. in 1993. One, all media messages are constructed. Two, media messages are constructed using a creative language with its own rules. Three, different people experience the same media message differently. Four, media are primarily businesses driven by a profit motive. And five, media have embedded values and points of view. Now, I don't expect any of those to blow your mind. In the year of our Lord 2024, most, if not all, of that probably seemed pretty intuitive. But the problem with intuitive things is that just because they're true, and we know them to be true, doesn't mean they're always at the top of our minds driving our actions. An MIT study from 2021 found that even though digital literacy was associated with a better ability to identify true versus false information, this did not appear to translate into sharing better quality information. Nor was analytic thinking correlated with better sharing quality. The problem, the study reasoned, was that people tend not to consider accuracy when deciding what to share online. Funny, cute, interesting, timely, sure. But accurate? That's lower on the list. The MIT study found that the only factor that moved the needle on the quality of content a person shared was procedural news knowledge, understanding how hard news is constructed and how mainstream media operate. An article from the European Journalism Observatory summed it up, noting that procedural news knowledge provides the internal scaffolding for bullshit detection and increases motivation to engage with legitimate sources. When it comes to nurturing an informed electorate, responsible news gathering, ethical journalism, and a truly free press are all incredibly important pieces of the puzzle and frankly deserve an entire video, which is coming soon. But for this video, we're focusing on the things we can control ourselves. So just for giggles, here's a little quiz to get a baseline for how news literate you are. Which of the following news outlets does not primarily depend on advertising for financial support? A commercial broadcaster, The New York Times, a public broadcaster, The Daily Wire, or I don't know. Which of the following is typically responsible for writing a press release? Spokesperson for an org, reporter for a news org, producer for a news org, lawyer for a news aggregator, I don't know. How are most of the individual decisions about what news stories to show people on Facebook made? Journalists that work for news outlets, journalists that work for Facebook, computer analysis, at random, I don't know. If you got at least two answers correct, you have a relatively high level of news literacy compared to most people from 18 countries who responded to identical questions posed in a joint Reuters-Oxford study in 2018. 32% of respondents didn't get a single answer correct. It's important for you to know your own level of news literacy because absent major incentives by the U.S. government or private companies, the onus is on us and our little bootstraps to be vigilant and commit to developing media literacy as a lived practice because the social platforms sure as hell aren't going to save us from ourselves. In the 2000s, media literacy became an educational field in its own right, which brought numerous professional organizations with internal disagreements and philosophical divides and general academic sprawl. The many subjects huddled under media literacy's umbrella wound up fighting for scarce resources and attention amongst themselves. In my public school, they prioritized making sure we knew how to use computers, conditioning us to be highly suspicious of internet sources like Wikipedia, and scared us about the consequences of posting private content online. And if you squint, all that is technically media literacy 
literacy education in some form or another. It's messy, but at least it was on someone's radar. And then social media took off, advancing the speed, scope, and stakes of mass communication yet again. Algorithms added a new dimension, a novel brand of hyper-targeted momentum designed to maximize engagement. And you know what consistently gets the most engagement? Sensational content, negative sensational content specifically, and nothing that challenges our current beliefs. We want to share stuff that reinforces what we already believe. And the algorithms know that. The platforms want us fired up, but in a way that keeps us doom scrolling. Unfortunately, it turned out that for some people, the line between doom scrolling and storming the Capitol was a little thinner than we might hope. Before Donald Trump, social media was widely hailed as a tool for vital political discourse, connection, and on the ground reporting. Despite the trolling and very real online abuse happening since its inception, social media was generally considered a boon for democracy and democratic discourse. And then Trump became the first U.S. presidential candidate to tweet unhinged shit at all hours of the day and night with no apparent regard for basic facts, and he changed the game. He was spewing nonsense to millions of followers, and the fact checkers could barely keep up. But though Trump may be the gasoline and the gaslight, he is not, in fact, the rotten source of our truth decay. MIT research from 2018 analyzed tweets posted between 2006 and 2007, long before Trump's run, and found that fake political news was the most likely to go viral. Using fun math and statistics, the researchers categorized the truth or falseness of more than four and a half million tweets, about 126,000 different stories. They then ranked the stories based on how viral they went on Twitter. And by the way, Twitter is the only name I will be using for that platform, okay? False information spread farther and faster, like six times faster than true stories. False stories are tailored to our interests. They're more sensational, more emotionally provocative, and more novel. We want to be told something we don't already know, but also something that we already agree with. Those patterns were already playing out in 2006, but it took the 2016 presidential election for us to realize in mass how dangerous those patterns could be. By 2019, interest in media literacy education was coming to the fore as a potential way to combat mis- and disinformation. And then 2020 came along and said, hold my fucking beer. And we got a global pandemic and another presidential election where fake news played a central role. A Pearson Institute poll found that 91% of Americans were concerned about the spread of false information in 2022. Nearly 75% of respondents felt that misinformation could fuel extreme political views and hate crimes. Of course, all those respondents had already witnessed the sharp rise in AAPI hate crimes as Asians were broadly scapegoated for causing COVID. So it's not surprising that the dangers were top of mind. But let me just pause again to point out that while these past patterns have been around for all of human existence, for instance, blaming minorities for complex global issues in moments of crisis, technology is amplifying and accelerating those patterns in ways that social media platforms must take accountability for. In early 2023, USC research found that social media platforms' internal reward structures are responsible for creating users who habitually share fake news. The study's co-author points to algorithms that prioritize engagement when selecting which posts users see in their newsfeed, and the structure and design of the sites themselves. According to USC Today, researchers found that habitual sharing of misinformation is part of a broader pattern of insensitivity to the information being shared. In fact, habitual users shared politically discordant news, news that challenged their political beliefs, as much as concordant news that they endorsed. 15% of the users studied were responsible for spreading as much as 40% of the fake news. That's startling, but also encouraging, because habits are conditioned, not innate, which means they can be corrected. The US USC researchers found that incentivizing accuracy instead of popularity, the current status quo, doubled the amount of accurate news that users shared. An MIT study, yes, another MIT study, found that when the warning labels on some false stories were complemented with verification labels on some of the true stories, participants were less likely to consider sharing false stories across the board. In those circumstances, they shared only 13.7% of the headlines labeled as false and just 26.9% of the non-labeled false stories stories. And that was true regardless of ideology. Participants were just as likely to dismiss stories labeled false, whether the content aligned with their existing views or not. So with all that in mind, Elon disbanded the trust and safety department, Musk, can frankly miss me with his First Amendment hand wringing. It's one thing to allow misinformation and hate speech on Twitter. If it were a public town square, which to be clear, it is not, it's a private company, people would be entitled to say more or less whatever they want. But there's a big difference between permitting fake news and promoting it. 
Since Elon took over the company in 2022, racist, anti-Semitic, and other hate speech have exploded. Climate change misinformation has reached millions of people. Russia, China, Hamas, and more have faced little interference in spreading propaganda across the platform. And if you're like, well, if you don't like it, just leave the platform, a lot of liberals did, which is part of what's made Twitter's transformation into a conservative hellscape all the more dramatic. After Elon took over, Bernie Sanders lost nearly 400,000 followers, about 3% of his base, while Republicans gained around 20% more followers between October 2022 and December 2023. Hoping to prepare young people to cope with the wild, wild west of social media platforms, media literacy education became a leading priority for teachers and even policymakers. A 2022 statement from the National Council for Teachers of English declared that media education must be an essential component of the professional identity of teachers. As of 2023, 18 states have incorporated media literacy language in official policy. In October, California Governor Gavin Newsom signed Assembly Bill 877 three into law, joining New Jersey, Delaware, and Texas in requiring media literacy instruction at every grade level. Still, media literacy education remains ill-defined and poorly funded. With no national set of media literacy standards, progress can be difficult to measure. And though it's incredibly important to teach young people about media literacy as early as possible, remember that the spread of misinformation is more about habit than knowledge. So our job is to continuously self-reflect and develop awareness of the traps we tend to fall into to better avoid them. To help us understand some of the most prominent pitfalls, I want to introduce you to some very special characters. This group is heavily inspired by the National Association of Media Literacy Educators' Media Monsters campaign, which is beautifully designed to serve elementary and middle school age students, but I think we could all benefit from befriending these little guys. Okay? This is Doomscroll Debra. She is a voracious consumer of information. The kind of person to have multiple screens going at once, notifications pinging every five seconds. It's truly mind-boggling how many news stories she keeps up with, seemingly in real time. Though primarily a danger to herself, Debra risks becoming so immersed in media consumption that she neglects the people around her, possibly even herself. You might be a Doomscroll Debra if you not only often lose track of time while using social media, but you also find it difficult to turn away long after it stops being fun. We're drawn to emotionally provocative content, but binging bad news is bad for mental health. And listen, I'm not preaching from on high. I do the same shit, okay? As I said, media literacy is an active practice, so we're all in danger of slipping into our own version of Doom Scroll Deborah or any of these characters at any time. So if you notice yourself digging a little too far down the rabbit hole, you might take a moment to ask yourself, what does this message want me to think or think about? Is this message good for me or people like me? How does this make me feel? How might I participate productively in reaction to this message? Is it time to take a break from social media for a little bit? Thanks so much, Deborah. What a beauty. Now meet Dennis from accounting. He has a photographic memory for headlines and a compulsive need to position himself as an expert in every conversation. Dennis will invite himself to your dinner party and spend the whole evening repeating things you overheard other people telling him at work. Oh, Dennis, you little rascal. He's the type to send you an article from The Onion without realizing it's satire. He's riding hype, making snap judgments, and repeating rumors. Suggested questions Dennis might ask himself include, is this fact, opinion, or something else? How credible is this, and how do I know? What information is missing? Can I trust this source to tell me the truth? Up next is Sharon Karen, and she needs to calm way the fuck down. She is barely skimming headlines before she shares content. It's all vibes and a caffeinated trigger finger just posting all day, every day. Karen is not thoughtful, which gets her into trouble when she inevitably fails to be sensitive to everyone in her audience and offends someone with an off-color meme or flippantly biased comment or just posts completely inaccurate information. In general, she needs to practice taking a beat, taking a breath, and asking herself, is this fact, opinion, or something else? What are the sources, ideas, or claims? How does this make me feel, and how do my emotions influence my interpretation of this message or how I share it? A recent Vox article laying out strategies to increase media literacy urged readers to remember the value of their attention, regardless of their follower count. Every reshare matters. Interacting with something on social media, whether a cautious share in case it's true, or a repost to point out that something definitely isn't, signals to the site's algorithms that you're interested in that content. Outrage shares are still shares, okay? And finally, we have sweet, gullible, naive Nathan. He tends to take things at face value without critically interrogating how the message may be manipulating him. One time, he came home from Costco with a mega-sized box of pirate booty cheese puffs because some gym bro on TikTok told him they were healthy. He's keeping the clickbait ad industry in business because he can never resist a juicy headline, even when it's clearly connected to a scammy ad. He's simply too optimistic for his own good, and he would benefit from being a little more skeptical. To help him develop a more critical 
critical eye for media, he might consider, what does this want me to think or think about? What did I learn from this? What is left out of this message that might be important to know? How does this make me feel? How do my emotions influence my interpretation? What can I learn about myself from my reaction or interpretation? Which character did you relate to most? Like I said, all of us have all of these in us. It's just a matter of how much we nurture or challenge those tendencies. Do you like to be cool? connected, in the know? Do you hate ads with a fiery burning passion? Well, I'm sorry, but this is an ad to join my Patreon community. There you can chat with me and my community, get early access to uncensored ad-free versions of these videos and more. So be cool, join my Patreon. As we've discussed throughout this video, humans have always struggled to distinguish fact from fiction, and AI is only intensifying the challenge, partly because its deep fake capabilities are getting so disturbingly convincing, but also because of how it's being positioned. Why is Google offering AI answers to my search queries at the top of the list when I know that AI lies all the time? I have seen multiple reports of fully licensed actual lawyers using ChatGPT to conduct legal research and then submitting filings that reference legal cases that do not exist. Do not rely on ChatGPT for facts, okay? But what about all the times we interact with AI and don't even know it? Deepfakes, a portmanteau combining deep learning and fake, replace the likeness of one person with another to generate hyper-realistic audio, images, and videos like this. We need to be more vigilant with what we trust from the internet. In its 2024 risk assessment report, the World Economic Forum identified AI-driven misinformation as an immediate threat that could destabilize societies. As AI technologies become more sophisticated and more widely accessible, little is stopping bad actors from leveraging them to sway public opinion and spread false information to undermine, for example, elections. In my video on AI and elections, we talked at length about the examples of AI-generated deepfakes disrupting democracies worldwide. Here in the US, the FCC banned robocalls featuring AI-generated voices, saddling violators with heavy fines and the threat of legal action. The ban passed after robocalls featuring an AI version of President Biden's voice dissuading people from voting inundated New Hampshire residents ahead of the state's primary election. We know the value of voting Democratic. The fake was disturbingly convincing. It was created by a company called Eleven Labs, which launched the beta version of its voice bot program in January 2023. Almost immediately, trolls were using it to make deep fakes of famous people saying terrible things, like having Emma Watson appear to read Mein Kampf. After the initial chaos, Eleven Labs limited access to the tool to paying customers and added a multi-step verification process to ensure that people were only cloning their own voices. But those safeguards were half-assed, and people quickly found loopholes. In October 2023, filmmaker Kenneth Lurt used the program to clone Jill Biden's voice to create a fake ad criticizing President Biden's handling of the Israel-Hamas war. The creative filmmaking combined with Eleven Lab's voice clone was startlingly convincing. My name is Jill Biden, and I want to tell you about my husband, Joe. Joe is the world's biggest cheerleader for the atrocities happening now in Gaza. The United States stands with Israel. Right now, the right-wing extremist government of Israel is raining down hell on Palestinian civilians. They've killed over a thousand children in the last few days. This is a genocide. <laughs> Normal people around the world are standing up and demanding an end to the horror. But the only one who can stop it is Joe. The United States of America is supporting the actions of Israel, and the U.S. taxpayer is funding it. So come on, Joe from Scranton. Tell Israeli George W. Bush no more money for his bombs. Cut the funding, call for a ceasefire end this fucking nightmare. The filmmaker said the clip took him about a week to make. President Biden's New Hampshire robocalls took far less time. The audio's creator claimed that using 11 labs cost him less than 20 minutes and $1. The risks to democracy though are incalculable. High quality deepfakes shared through sophisticated bot networks and amplified by social media algorithms could lead to widespread misinformation about everything from world events to election information. Context clues like how nicely a website is designed or how completely an account seems to have mastered English will no longer function as reliable tells that something is fake or otherwise off. This threatens the very foundation of public trust in media. The more skeptical we become, the more we'll insulate ourselves from authentic information that we should be using to make decisions. 
Eleven Labs has been increasing restrictions on how its technology can be used, but motivated nerds are difficult to stay ahead of. The company developed a tool that identifies other AI, but believes the ultimate solution will be a digital watermarking system so that AI-generated voices can be automatically identified. But that would require a lot of cooperation between tech companies, and it isn't around the corner overnight silver bullet type of solution. This means that, once again, it's up to us to distinguish real from fake. So consider this your PSA. Hi, I'm Legia Miller. I'm here to talk to you about something I really care about, democracy. Think about this. Did you know that our democracy is at risk because of a new technology known as artificial intelligence? Artificial intelligence, or AI, allows anyone with a connection to the World Wide Web to create audio, images, and even video that looks realistic but isn't actually real. This can make you believe something is true when it actually isn't. So next time you're scrolling on the information superhighway and you see a photo or video, look for the following signs that it's made by AI. Is there a face in the image or video? Deepfakes almost always focus on facial transformations. Look at the cheeks and the forehead. Do they seem unnaturally smooth or unmoving? Do they seem too bright or washed out compared to the lighting in the rest of the image? Look at the eyes. Do they blink naturally or not at all? Is the shadow under the eyes or eyebrows natural or does it seem off? Are they wearing glasses or is a mirror depicted in the scene? Check to see if the glare on the glasses matches the lighting in the scene and look at the mirror to see if it matches the scene it's reflecting. Look at the hair and facial hair. Is it moving normally or does it seem fake, stiff, or incongruous? Look at the lip movements. Do they look synced with the sound or are they slightly off? Pay attention to where the neck meets the rest of the body. Is it moving naturally or does it jump around or seem like the wrong color? In still images, look at the hands and the details. Often, people will have an unusual number of fingers, the edges of their hair will be blurred, or lines won't meet up where they should. Sometimes, using these tips will help you spot the fake content. But technology is getting pretty advanced, so even a trained eye may not be able to spot what's real and what's fake. So it's important to keep the following things in mind, no matter what media you're consuming. Where did this video or image come from? Can you name the source? If not, keep some healthy skepticism. If you know the source, is that source generally reputable? Is it an established news organization, educational institution, or other source that has a track record of posting true, reliable information? Or is it a source with an unknown or shady track record? Does a quick search online confirm the information depicted in the video? Be sure to cross-check the information in the video before believing it to be true. Also ask why this person or entity shared this video. Do they have an ulterior motive? Are they trying to form a narrative or manipulate the conversation? Together, we can fight this war and promote deceptive AI and deepfake democracy interference education for all. But I can't do this alone. The world needs daddy. When bad actors and foreign adversaries threaten our elections, daddy saves the day. Daddy wants you to say no to fake news. Will you listen? This message brought to you by daddy. Shout out to my newest supporters on Patreon, as well as supporters in my royal tiers, and a very special shout out to my multi-platinum supporters, T, Latranger Lucas, Joshua Cole, Thomas Johnson, Sophia Sams, Anthony Giles, Tay, and Brett Piontek. Your generosity makes this channel what it is, so thank you. And if you like this video, you'll probably also enjoy the one about why conservatives fall for fake news. Thanks so much for watching, have a good day, Bye bye